There is so much to say about Jesus. There is so much to say about Jerusalem. And there is so much to say about Jesus in Jerusalem. But in this video, we want to keep it simple and take you on a tour that will pass through five of the most important sites concerning Jesus in Jerusalem. I'm here with Itai, one of my best friends. We made a video together about how to plan a seven to 10 days itinerary in Israel. And I will leave a link to that video below. Let's get started. Hi guys, we're starting this video from the top of the Mount of Olives where most Christian oriented tours in Jerusalem starts. We are now at a site that is known today as the Mask of Ascension. There are many sites on the Mount of Olives and we're actually starting at the end. So what is this place and how come we're starting our tour following Jesus at a mask? Jesus was crucified and buried on a Friday and on Sunday, the tomb was found empty. Following the resurrection, Jesus walked the earth for 40 days. And if it sounds familiar, it's because Jesus spent 40 days in the Judean desert being tested by the devil right after his baptism by John. And Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai. So it's a very auspicious number. At the end of those 40 days, right after the resurrection, Jesus comes here to the Mount of Olives and from here he ascends up to the heavens to return again at a chosen time. And at Luke we read, And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heavens, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So we would like to know, is this really the place where it happened? Is the rock on the floor of the chapel that we're going to see soon, is the place where Jesus ascended? We will find out later on. Let's go into the structure. The first church was built here during the Byzantine era. After it got destroyed, a crusader chapel was built and was later remodeled by the Ottomans to become a mosque. So, here we are inside. And while there may not be much to see, we do have a tradition that say that when Jesus ascended from here, his foot left a mark on the dirt, and although it should have been disappeared, it kept on appearing again and again until eventually it solidified into the rock. And this rock is what we see today. As we head to the Church of Gethsemane, I just want to say that in this video, I will also be showing you the route we are walking. These are really the best routes for tourists to take as they will give you a better understanding of where you are going and allow you to see what Jerusalem looks like between the sites. I will be adding chapters to the video timeline. So if you don't want to see the route, you can jump straight to the next explanation.
If at the top of the Mount of Olives we saw the divine side of Jesus, then here at the lowest part in the valley between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount, we see the human side of Jesus at his hardest hour. After eating the Last Supper in Jerusalem, we will soon be seeing where that took place. Jesus started walking back to the Mount of Olives with three of his disciples, and he came here, and I'm reading from Mark 14. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them sleep asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they didn't know what to answer him. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whoever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away. To commemorate the event, a church was built here. The name of this area is Gethsemane, which is actually two words in Hebrew, Gat and Shmanim, or oil and press. You can see the ancient olive trees and archaeological findings show that oil was produced in this area. The church, which was opened in 1924, is also called the Church of All Nations, as 12 countries donated money to build it, countries that fought against one another in World War I. Antonio Barluzzi, the architect, designed a dark church to emphasize the dark hour of Jesus. But like most churches in Israel, and we saw it also in the Mosque of Ascension, it is not the building that's important, but the bedrock. And next to the altar, you can see the bedrock, as if to say it happened right here. But did it really happen here? Itai will talk about that at the next stop.
We are now in the Davidson Archaeological Center. When Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon, was here, he said that being here he felt much more thrilled than he did up on the moon. Why did he say it here, at a staircase, and not in one of the important churches or biblical sites that surrounds us? Well, because he knew what he was talking about. We've seen two churches with bedrocks. How can we know that these are really the places where these things happened? We can't. The story does make sense. Almost all the places in the New Testament have been identified, but we can't really pinpoint if it was this stone or that stone. Here is one of the few places where we can say for sure that Jesus walked on this very rock that I'm standing on. We are now standing at the Hulda staircase, right under the Hulda gates. It got its name from a woman prophet, Hulda, who is believed to be buried near here. During the times of the Second Temple, this staircase was one of the most important places in the Jewish world. It is here that pilgrims took their last steps before entering the Temple Mount. Imagine dreaming about this moment for your entire life, saving money for the journey, preparing the family and then finally arriving here and walking up towards the Holy of Holies. To make this moment even more dramatic, each step of the staircase was built in a different size, so you can't just run up. You have to bow your head down, conscious of each step you take. You walk slowly. This is the moment you've been waiting for, for such a long time. At the end of the staircase, there were two gates, one for the people entering and the other for the ones leaving. One of these gates was quite well preserved and it's right here, as was the original rock at its foot that I'm standing on. This is the rock that all the people who left the temple walked on, including Jesus himself and the apostles. There is no church here, no synagogue, but in its simplicity, this is one of the most touching places in Jerusalem to see and experience. From here, we continue to another important place, which is, by the way, also not a church.
we have now entered one of the most important Christian sites in Jerusalem. This is traditionally believed to be where the Last Supper took place. So it's Passover Eve, one of the most auspicious holidays in the Jewish calendar, commemorating the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and their journey from slavery to freedom. That's when Jesus comes here with the apostles to celebrate the feast of Passover. During the feast, it remains traditional to this day to bless on four cups of wine and the Passover bread. Then Jesus adds to the blessing, saying, and I quote, take this bread and eat it, it is my body. Then he took a cup of wine, thanks God for it, and gave it to them. He said, each one of you drink some of it. This wine is my blood, which will be poured out to forgive the sins of many and begin the new agreement from God to his people. I want you to know, I will not drink this wine again until that day we are together in my Father's kingdom and the wine is new. Then I will drink it again with you. And thus, the ceremony of the Holy Communion was given. It's hard to underestimate the importance of this event that affects the lives of so many to this day. And that's why almost every Christian group visiting Jerusalem from every denomination comes here to pray. How come this place is not a church? For a long time there was a Franciscan church here, but during the Ottoman time it became a mosque and today it is managed by the government and does not belong to any one organization. I named this video Five Must See Sites Plus One because we couldn't be here and not mention another event that happened here, although it doesn't involve Jesus himself. In fact, it is the first event that happened here after Jesus ascended to heaven. The room of the Last Supper is also the place where 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven, so 50 days after Passover, the disciples meet here and the Holy Spirit descended upon them and they began to speak in tongues. So you could also say that the church as an organization started here. I mentioned that it happened 50 days after Passover because the word for 50 in Greek is Pentecost, and that is the name of the fest, Pentecost. The Jews celebrate Shavuot, the fest of weeks, which is also the celebration of Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. So the day the Jews celebrate the giving of the Torah is the day of which the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples. Another interesting connection here is the geographical aspect. We are now located in the upper room and beneath us is the tomb of King David. And the first verse in the New Testament starts with the connection between Jesus and King David.
I've talked about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in many of my videos, so now I will only talk about the tomb itself. There are many versions of the story of how Helena, the mother of Constantine, found the grave 300 years after the events, that an old Jew showed her the site, that when she found the three crosses, she passed them on to a sick woman, but when the true cross was over her, she was cured. These stories don't really help us establish if Jesus really was buried here. So what do we know? This area was outside Jerusalem at the time. This was a Jewish burial site. Golgotha, which is a natural hill that was higher than its surrounding at that time. In 2017, the tomb was opened and renovated by the National Technical University of Athens, and they confirmed that it was a single new grave that was used once, unlike other places where there were double graves or the tomb was reused. Now, is it possible that the first followers of Jesus actually knew the location of the site for 300 years? This is a big question. Jesus was crucified around the year 30. In the year 70 and in the year 135, there were two Jewish revolts during which the city was destroyed and then rebuilt as a Roman city. Is it possible that followers of Jesus came back to Jerusalem between and after the rebellions and recognized the site? could be. There was probably a statue or some kind of temple to Aphrodite that the Romans built on the burial site, which is actually an indicator that it was a place of worship. Contrary to what many people might think, when different empires, different religions become established, they all built their um, holy site on top of the holy sites that already exist. They don't invent new places. Nothing makes a site holier than competition with another religion. In Jerusalem, we can see this at many different sites. So can we know for sure that this is the tomb of Jesus? No, but it is possible. Now to a more important question, does it really matter? No, as Jesus is not here. If you haven't subscribed until now, please do. The next videos are going to be about the city of David and a place you've never seen, the place where the Jordan River enters the Dead Sea. So please subscribe. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I did. Making a video with a good friend is much more fun. I sometimes get email from people asking me to guide them around Israel. I'm sorry, but now I'm working on my videos and my app but I can definitely recommend some guys. I would recommend, of course, Itai. He's also standing right next to me, so I pretty much have to recommend him. Avirama, a good friend of ours, is also a great guide in the Galilee. We did the guiding course together like 11, 12 years ago. Itai and Avirama have cars. I mean, I also have a car, my non-electric Mazda, but they also have the necessary license you need to drive tourists around. If you are planning something bigger, if you are coming with a group or church, if you are planning a wedding or bar mitzvah in Israel, or you want a high-end tour, then I would recommend Asaf and Rem, my partners in, in Shin Tours, as you need an office with the people you can talk to and through which you can organize logistics and special activities. Falls Sie eine deutschsprachige Guide suchen, kann ich ein paar Freunden empfehlen. Yossi Tal und Evelyn, die beiden wohnen in Galilea, und Schmuel Khan wäre meine Empfehlung, wenn Sie einen lokalen Guide hier in Jerusalem suchen. Below the video, I will leave a link to their contact details. See you next week. Yalla bye.